All right. Well, welcome everyone to the Western Slope College Fair. And today we'll be talking about a very important issue, which is financial aid. Um, so you'll be understanding all kinds of financial aid information today. And we have some wonderful presenters for you. Um, but just a quick uh, point about format today. We're going to be having this presentation for around 30 minutes or so. It's going to be recorded and then shared again with you later. Um, but if you want to come back for the second session, we'll be having another session after the college fair. Um, we'll be doing 30 minutes of the presentation, and then we'll have a quick sort of 10 to 15 minutes afterwards for question and answers from our presenters. And so today we have Grace from Grinnell and Rayanne from SLU, and I'm going to throw it over to them to start presenting. Thanks, y'all. Cool. Do you want to go first, Rayanne? Just sure. Hi. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Hi, everyone. My name is Rayanne Mena, and I am the Assistant Director of Admission at St. Louis University, which is located in St. Louis, Missouri. And I'm thrilled to be here today to talk to you about financial aid. Yeah, and hello, everyone. My name is Grace Robertson Lloyd. I work at Cornell College, a small private liberal arts college located in Iowa. Uh, and I'm also really excited to be a part of this presentation and get to talk to you about this very important topic. Um, we're going to be going over a few different things today. So we have an agenda listed here. When it comes to this agenda, like we will go through each of these topics in order. What Rayanne and I ask is that if you have questions, please put them in the chat or, you know, make sure that they get out, but we will not be answering them until the end of our presentation, just for the sake of time. And the fact that many of the questions that you might ask, we actually might end up getting to just naturally by going through these topics. So we are going to be going through a lot of things, but as questions come up, please put them in the chat and we will answer them at the end during our Q&A. Uh, one thing I also wanted to mention is that when it comes to financial aid, every single school is different. There are so many different colleges and universities, and they all have different programs for scholarships, for their need-based aid, for uh, their application processes. And so the important thing to know is that while we are going over some of the basics, some of the jargon and terminology that it's important to know when you are going through the financial aid process, every school is different and it is important to look at each school's website, to contact their financial aid offices, and to make sure that you're having these conversations with their offices, with their staff, with your counselors, if you have a counselor available to you or with your family, et cetera, because all these schools do things very differently. And what we are presenting today is more the building blocks, the starting uh, point for you to understand and be able to navigate this process. Um, but that's my, my quick uh, just note on that. Now, one thing that we wanna always start with is just what is the goal of financial aid? Um, and it might seem obvious, right? But it's actually not quite as obvious as I think people you know, think, right? Because the point of, financial aid is it encompasses multiple different types of ways for colleges to support students or the government to support students. So the point is that we are rewarding student achievements, your GPA. Uh, if you are applying to a school that accepts testing, potentially your test scores, uh, your extracurricular activities, things like that. And especially with merit scholarships, those will play into it. It's also based on your family's ability to pay the educational cost of the institution you are applying for. And then one of the big things is that each institution has this goal of financial aid and supporting students and how much they are able to pay and also distributing resources in an equitable manner. So knowing how much one family can pay means that we can better support that family in an equitable process um, based on their own financial situation. So uh, every situation, every family is different when it comes to their financial aid, uh, when it comes to what their expected family contribution, which we will go over, is, and things like that. And then the last thing is that the goal of financial aid is to balance gift aid, which is money you do not need to pay back, such as scholarships or grants, and then self-help aid. So loans that you might take out or the institution might suggest, or work study, which is when you work on campus in order to support yourself as a student and your tuition payments. Now, one thing I did want to go over, just because this is something um, and not, you know, a handful of schools, about 100 probably uh, have a need blind process. The majority of schools in the United States tend to have a need aware process. What this means is that if a school is need aware, a student's expected family contribution or EFC is taken into account during the application review process. So basically, a family's ability to pay is considered 
when deciding whether to admit, deny, or waitlist a student. Need blind means that a student's ability to pay is not taken into account during the application review process. So in the case of Grinnell College, for example, we are a need blind school for domestic students. We cannot see any financial information when we are reviewing an application for admission. It's just based on whether a student is a good fit and we think that they could succeed at the college. And one thing I also wanted to mention is that there's only about 12 schools in the United States that meet full need, meaning the entire need based off of the expected family contribution of a family is met without loans, which we will go into the specific loan process. And that is on top of being need blind for domestic students. Grinnell is one of those institutions. There are lists of these institutions. But the point is that the majority of schools are either need aware or do not meet full need or include loans in their packaging. And this is why it's so important to look at institutions' websites, to contact their financial aid offices, because every school does do it so differently. Now, there are different types of financial aid, as I mentioned. Scholarships, we'll go into a little more detail about merit awards and things like that. But the point is, a scholarship is money that you don't need to pay back, but often you do have to have some uh, you know, requirement to maintain that. Some scholarships you might need to reapply to to have them continue. For example, at Grinnell College, you don't need to reapply for your merit-based award, but you do need to maintain a 2.75 GPA in order to keep it, and it is renewable annually. A lot of schools approach merit scholarships differently. Some base it off of GPA test scores. Some approach it through a holistic review process, meaning every single part of your application is uh, makes you eligible or not for a merit-based award. Some schools do a great job of actually having tables where you can see, I have this GPA and this test score, what award would I be receiving? So again, it's important to look at uh, websites and see what they offer in terms of these different types of financial aid regarding merit scholarships. Grants are money that you do not have to pay back. So that's an award that, that is given to you. You are not expected to return that money. That is just yours. Employment opportunities, I mentioned before, but work study. So federal learning work study is basically a way for students to get a job on campus. It could be dining hall or at some institutions, it could be tour guiding, or you could get paid to be a research assistant, whatever it might be. And that money basically goes towards your tuition. Some schools will allow students to work on campus even if it is not a part of their work study, uh, which is a really nice opportunity. And depending on the school, it can be anywhere from you know, eight to 10 hours, I think is pretty typical of uh, a week of expected work in order to earn that money for your work study for your uh, financial aid program. And then lastly, loans. Uh, we will get more into that. Grinnell does not uh, offer loans in financial aid packages. so. I'm definitely not the expert Rayanne is, but there are so many different ways to take out loans, so many different types of loans, and we will go over those in more detail, but the big thing with loans is that remember that that is money you have to pay back. Um, so with work study and loans, basically that is money you either have to earn or pay back to the institution over time or to the government over time, depending on the program, or to your private loan uh, donor. So. Now, the last thing I will talk about before handing it over to Rayanne is some of these documents that are really important for you to be uh, looking over, right? So every school obviously will have an admission application. Some schools will use the common application or the coalition application, which are ways to apply to multiple institutions at once through one application that goes to each school. Some schools also will have their own institution specific application. Again, it is so important to look at the websites and see what you need to do in order to apply effectively to these institutions. Uh, for example, some schools might accept coalition and common app and have their own application. Some schools might accept QuestBridge as an application regardless of whether a student has matched. And so these are all very important things to just know. We wanna make this as streamlined a process as possible, but the fact is there are different ways to apply and it is important to look at it. And when it comes to those merit scholarships, often your admission application and how aid plays into your admission app is through these merit awards. So GPA, 
test scores and holistic review, as I mentioned before, are some things that only can come through your admission application. They are not based on need. And so those merit awards come through that in particular. Now the FAFSA determines your federal aid eligibility. There are some different options for that, such as federal Pell, SEOG, which we will go into more soon. And then of course the federal student loan, which we will talk about in much more detail soon. And then there is the CSS profile, which is not always required of students. It depends on the institution. At Grinnell, for example, it is required of students to submit both FAFSA and CSS profile. It requests additional information, so it can give some schools a different view of a student's financial situation. Uh, and it's basically a way, especially I feel like private institutions to get some additional information that can help them when awarding uh, need-based financial aid. I will let you take it away. Yeah. yeah, thanks, Grace. Thank you so much. So Grace kind of gave us a really good overview of kind of what to expect. And I'm going to spend a few slides and Grace is going to join me at various points to dig into kind of some of the nitty gritty that like, OK, I know what I have to do now. How do I do it? And so one of the big things we talked about on the on the FAFSA slide um, is, you know, the FAFSA, if you're not familiar with the term, stands for free. I'm um, sorry for it says for uh, the FAFSA form is the federal government. Um, form that everyone uses, everyone fills out in order to be eligible for federal aid. Um, and so it, the big part of it is it's free. You should never be charged um, to fill out the FAFSA. And we'll talk a little bit about that process. One of the big things the FAFSA does, Grace mentioned this, is it determines a number called the expected family contribution or the EFC. And we're going to talk through that a little bit more as we go. Um, but one of the ways, but basically what that is, is it's a calculation um, to, to help you to kind of streamline and make it the same for everybody that's been determined by Congress and the Department of Education to help determine how much a family should contribute to their child's education or to their student's education. Um, and one of the ways they do that is by, of course, um, accessing income information, tax information. So this slide here is dedicated to an interesting aspect of um, the FAFSA, and that is the use of the IS IRS data retrieval tools. So the FAFSA used to be really overwhelming. Family members would have to pull out their taxes and write down, you know, put, look up last year's income and, and make sure they're entering all the numbers correctly. But there's a new tool out there. Um, that you can use via the IRS website called the IRS Data Retrieval Tool, which just allows students and parents, because you might have had some tax information as well, to access and transfer the needed data directly from the IRS to the FAFSA. So um, as we're going to talk through, we kind of jumped ahead with this slide, but we're going to talk through in the next couple slides filling out the FAFSA and how to get started. Um, but wanted to bring your attention to this because if you're eligible to, to use the IRS data retrieval tool, we highly recommend using it because it eliminates mistakes, right? You don't all of a sudden add an extra zero to the income, which makes it look like you've got all this money instead of the reality. So um, the nice thing about using the, the IRS data retrieval tool is that if you use it, um, you don't need to provide additional copies of tax transcripts and things like that. So keep the IRS data retrieval tool in mind. We'll go on to the next slide. Um, to kind of help get you started. So when we really think about sort of this timeline, and I know we probably got a variety of, of you know, students of different ages and different years in school in the audience, but when we think about sort of your senior year um, timeline, what we're kind of looking at is, you know, August to December is, is when you're visiting colleges, maybe applying to schools for sure. Um, but the FAFSA actually just opened on October 1st. And so there, it's a great opportunity to kind of get a jump start early as you're filling out those college applications to also be applying for financial aid. So we're going to talk a little bit about how you fill out the FAFSA if you haven't done that yet. It's not something you have to do right on October 1st. You're not late. You're not, you know, behind the game. But again, like Grace said, you're going to want to check with your individual colleges because some of us have different priority deadlines for when we would like the FAFSA by. Like at my institution, St. Louis University, we have a February 1st priority deadline for filling out the FAFSA. We say, if you fill it out by February 1st, we just know we're gonna be able to give you the best consideration for you know, all the different types of aid. But another school might have an earlier deadline, it might be January, it might be December. So while you don't have to fill it out like this week, if you haven't done it, leaving this presentation today with some steps on how to do it if you are a senior, um, is huge because the sooner you kind of get it done and, and organized, the better. So once you've submitted your FAFSA, um, you know, when you've submitted your applications, this is a, a pretty broad range depending on whether you're applying early or rolling or regular decision. The next few months, November through March, you could get um, 
acceptance letters. You could also get financial aid packages with some of those acceptance letters. And so there'll be a lot. I got this question once in a presentation, which comes first? The admit letter, the admit packet will always come first. We will never really send you a uh, financial aid letter if you haven't been accepted um, to the university. So sometimes they can come really close together and sometimes you can be admitted um, first, you know, and then a few weeks later or a few months later, get your financial aid package. All this leads us to kind of that May 1st, you know, candidate reply date, which is um, when everyone makes their college choices and submits their deposits and accepts financial aid. And then you spend the summer kind of getting registered for classes, figuring out how, you know, finalizing how you're going to pay for it and all those great things. So I'm ready for the next slide, Grace. Thanks. Okay. So is this you, Grace? Sorry. Yeah, I can jump okay, in great. really yeah, quick. So, yeah, so um, I love going over that timeline just because I think that is really helpful, uh, Rayanne, thank you. Um, and you might be wondering, what can I do right now, right? Because applications aren't yet due, decisions are not yet coming out. You know, um, it's again, important to look at those deadlines, uh, like Rayanne said, but there are some things that you can get involved in right now. Rayanne will go into detail about the FSA IDs, how to create those, and then also the FAFSA practice tools, um, so ways to you know, practice um, as you're working on these applications. But one thing I wanted to highlight is net price calculators and my intuition. So there is on every college website, <laughs> a net price calculator. This is federally mandated. And it's basically a way to get a ballpark estimate of what you might be expected to pay for that college education or that university's education. Uh, the important thing with the net price calculator uh, and with my intuition, which is a quick cost estimator based on a specific institution, very similar to a net price calculator, um, but it's even faster to fill out and it's um, through a different organization. Um, but with both of these, remember that you have to put good information in to get good information out. If you are not uh, accurate with the information you are putting into the net price calculator related to taxes and income and things like that, you will not get good information coming out of these calculators, but they are very excellent ways to get that ballpark estimate, but they are really dependent on what you are putting into them. So I highly recommend using these for any institution that you're considering applying to. For institutions that offer both, for example, Grinnell offers both the net price calculator and my intuition quick cost estimator, go ahead and use them both. Um, and remember that that number is not static. It is not perfect. It depends on what you have put in but it gives you a very good estimate of what that might cost. And it's also a great way because um, there are some schools that their sticker price, right, their price tag might be very expensive, but they actually give out a lot of aid. And that's important to know um, because it can make certain colleges much more affordable than you might think. And using the net price calculator, my intuition, will reveal those colleges to you pretty pretty quickly. Um, so highly recommend using those. Uh, Rayanne, do you wanna stay on this slide or should I jump to the next one? Yep, you can go to the next slide. Yeah, that would be great. Thanks, Grace. Awesome. So Grace mentioned something called the FSA ID and you might be thinking again, all these terms you're hearing FAFSA and all these acronyms. Um, so we're trying to break it down for you as much as possible. But the FAFSA, it, because it does pull in a lot of personal information, you'll put your date of birth, you will you know, put your um, social security number in a sense in there um, and, and some very specific you know, financial information. We wanna make it, the government wanted to make it as safe um, as possible. And so you very rarely put that information, um, a lot of that information in multiple times. And so what they have done is they have created something called the Federal Student Aid ID. And every person that is going to be involved in the FAFSA, student, parent, guardian, will each need um, their FSA ID. And so this is something you can create now. Even if your you know, um, family member says to you, we're not ready to fill out the FAFSA, it's going to be a few weeks. Going in and requesting your FSA ID now is something simple that you can do. It all happens on the studentaid.gov website. And I will tell you that is the, the website you want to go to for all things FAFSA and financial aid related. It is the government website with that GOV. It'll have the free application for federal student aid. Um, it will have, you know, the place to, for you to create your FSA ID. We just have to say a quick note that sometimes people love to create offshoots of websites, like it'll be FAFSA.com. And all of a sudden you're like, why am I being asked to pay $25 to fill out the FAFSA? You should never have to pay for anything related to filing for financial aid besides the CSS profile. Um, so make sure when you're filling out anything related to the FAFSA um, that you're on the studentaid.gov website. So once you're there, 
you just click, um, you know, you can see the little screenshot over here. It'll walk you through creating your FSA ID. Um, and then the nice thing about this FSA ID is it's yours for all of your years of college. If you go to grad school, those types of things. Um, so it makes the process a little bit easier when you go back in every year. You're not starting from scratch. You're not re-entering everything. You simply are logging in via your FSA ID. Um, and it stores your information, you can update taxes, those types of things. So this again is something simple that you can go ahead and do you know, today, tomorrow, next week as you prepare to fill out the FAFSA because you will need to do it ahead of time. All right, Grace, I'm ready for the next one. Great, perfect, okay. So we talked, you know, Grace mentioned EFC and I kind of talked about it when we were talking about the IRS data retrieval tool. And it really, a lot of people, you know, if you have had any, older siblings or gone through the process or cousins or different family members and you're just like I just remember I just hear that nobody thinks you know that everybody thinks that the government thinks they can pay more for college than they can we hear that a lot working in admissions and financial aid um, but how it's been streamlined and how it's been processed is through this federal methodology and I mentioned before it is a formula created by Congress to determine the EFC um, the Department of Education uses it to, to make the determination not the individual schools so one of the big things here to, to kind of keep in mind um, is that, you know, St. Louis University, Grinnell have no control over what the EFC number is for you. We can take certain things into consideration beyond the EFC, uh, but the EFC, the formula is the same for every family. It looks at student, parent, income information and assets. It includes, it's going to take into consideration, consideration that you live on the Western Slope of Colorado and things are a little bit more expensive. It's going to take into consideration that there are you know, five people in your family or seven people in your family or three people in your family. And all of those factors kind of go in. And once you've put all that information into the FAFSA, how large your family is, where you live, what your income is, what your assets are, um, that is how the FAFSA would determines your EFC. And so when you're done filling out the FAFSA, you actually get um, a notification of what your expected family contribution is. So you could be done with it and it could say, guess what? Your expected family contribution is $10,000 a year for college or it's $20,000 a year. That number gets sent to the schools that you've been listed, that has been listed on your financial aid, your FAFSA. And from there, they work um, within their own rules and processes, as Grace mentioned, some are need, you know, gonna meet 100% of need, some are not, um, to come up with a financial aid package for you. And so, that's sort of a good transition to, to the next slide. Um, Grace, to, thank you, perfect. Um, Grace in a couple of slides is gonna to talk to you a little bit about how the EFC plays against the cost of attendance. And so I need to introduce the concept of cost of attendance. When you think about what a school really costs, um, most of the time we're just thinking about tuition, fees and room and boards. And those are what we call the direct costs. Those are what you're gonna see on your actual bill. Um, the, those types of costs. But, you know, you know, I was going to say Grinnell is in Iowa and St. Louis is in Missouri and you could be going to school in Massachusetts from Colorado and you might, your family might say, well, we're so excited for you to go to school on the East Coast, but like, gosh, you're going to need four plane tickets a year and that's, you know, an additional thousand, two thousand dollars. Like, how are we going to, we got to factor that in. So the cost of attendance of a school allows a school to say to a family, hey, yeah, you might need some money through financial aid for books and supplies or transportation, or maybe you are taking out a loan and you need to know how to pay those fees. And so when we look at the budget and when we talk about the actual cost, a lot of schools will include some provisions or some estimates so that if you did need additional aid for your books for a semester, those types of things, that it's not just, okay, all you get is tuition, room and board and fees, and that's it. So there are things in place to once we get that EFC to see how much um, you're actually eligible for. So I'm ready for the next slide. Oh, and this is you, perfect, yeah. Yeah, and so basically um, with the cost of attendance, uh, that is the, as Rayanne explained, like the predicted cost of attendance for you to attend said institution. And your expected family contribution is how much you can actually pay of that amount. And so the cost of attendance minus your expected family contribution equals your need. And so need does change dependent on the student, but basically by doing that simple math, which is what the net price calculator does, which is what my intuition does, you can see based on what you can pay or rather what you cannot pay, uh, what the institution will determine as what they must give you. And they will give you and meet your need, dependent on the school, 
for example, Grinnell, which meets 100% of demonstrated financial need, will meet that need through grants, um, through scholarships, through work study. And then while Grinnell does not do loans in their initial financial packaging, other institutions will include loans as a part of their packaging as well. So those are all different ways that the institutions will meet your demonstrated financial need in order for you to be able to afford that institution. And now not every institution will be able to meet your full need. And that's important to know. Again, this is why it's really important to look at institutions' websites, contact their financial aid offices, and do these net price calculators, as it'll give you a better sense of what you might be expected to pay based on your specific financial need, your specific financial situation uh, for that institution. Let's see what the next one is. Oh, Perfect. this is all you. Perfect. Yeah, perfect. Awesome. And I just got a lot, I got a good reminder from our lovely moderator who just reminded me that this year the EFC terminology has changed from being called the EFC to the student to be called the student aid index. So if you're a senior and you're filling out your FAFSA and you get something called your student aid index instead of your EFC, um, just note that that is new terminology that we're using. My financial aid office did this presentation earlier this summer updated it. And so I, they must have done it before that change came through, but just know a lot of times it takes a while for terminology to transition anyway. So EFC, what's formerly known as EFC will now be called the student aid index. So just wanted to make you aware of both terminologies in case you leave this presentation and we're like, well, I never saw the word EFC ever again. So, okay. So basically what, what we, when we fill out the FAFSA and you get that EFC or that student aid index number, um, the schools are going to use it to determine your eligibility for um, different programs that are run through the federal government. And, and two of them are grant programs. So um, things that don't, again, that don't have to be paid back. This is national eligibility as opposed to individual school eligibility, though in individual schools have a certain amount of Pell Grants and FCOG and those types of awards that they can do. So you might be thinking, why am I filling all this out? Why does it matter? Should I be filling out the FAFSA? To be eligible for um, things like the, the federal backed grant programs, you do need to fill out the FAFSA. Um, so keep that in mind. The other thing it makes you eligible for is the federal work study job, which Grace talked about earlier, is the ability to work on campus and earn money um, either towards your tuition or for your, again, personal, you know, direct costs for, I mean, your cost of attendance. So for those plane tickets, for those books, that type of thing. Typically a work study job, you're earning about, um, it's usually about $1,500 a semester, $3,000 a year. So in and of itself, it's not a huge amount, but it only requires you to work, you know, maybe 10 hours a week um, during the semester. So it's easy to balance. There's a great opportunity to either apply that money directly towards your tuition um, if there's still a balance due, or a lot of times that becomes the spending money for some of their students. If everything else is paid for, um, they can use that money uh, to help pay for some of those travel and books and supplies costs that come out through the school year. So the, again, the number of the student aid index or the EFC is what um, we go, you know, what determines um, your eligibility for some of these federal programs. So we can go on to the next slide, Grace. Thanks. Okay. So one of the other things that the FAFSA makes you eligible for is um, some of the federal direct loans. And we, you know, meet so many students during the process who are like, I'm not interested in loans or my parents said loans are bad or we're not going to um, be involved in it. And there's a lot of different lo loan types, as Grace mentioned. And so one of the things I want to just kind of mention and let you know that just for filling out the FAFSA, um, even if it said, you know, your, your EFC or your student aid index was, you know, the cost, like $80,000 that, and, and there would be no aid, you would still be eligible for um, some federally backed direct loans. And you can see the two different types of loans up here. There is subsidized and unsubsidized. And we'll talk about that um, a little bit here. Um, and then we will talk about the, you know, obviously they differ in name, they differ in amount and some of the different rules. So one of the big things here is the subsidized loan you can see is based on need. This loan, the subsidized loan, um, the federal government pays the interest on this loan while you are in college. So if you got a $3,500 subsidized loan and you took it, when you graduated four years later, you would, if you only took it one year, you would just have $3,500 to pay back versus the unsubsidized loan, which is not um, based on need. And that's what a lot of people see on theirs. Um, it just gives you a total of $5,500. The interest does accrue on that while you are doing your four years of undergraduate. So when you graduate, 
you might see um, a slight, you know, a slightly higher amount than the $5,500 you originally took out. The nice thing about these loans is that they are manageable amounts. I know that, you know, sometimes families are like no loans, but these are small amounts with really great fixed interest rates. And sometimes for families, it's a way to have the student invest in their education to say, okay, you know what, for four years, you're gonna have a $3,000 loan, you'll graduate with this amount of debt um, and, and it's, it, you can pay it back this way. Um, you can see here, repayment begins six months after you graduate or fall below half-time status. If you go on to graduate school, um, the loans continue to stay in forbearance. So if you go to medical school or law school, you will not have to pay them back. And you can see that every year that you're in school, the amount you're eligible for increases um, sophomore year and then again, junior year um, through senior year. So you'll see these a lot. Again, just warning you because a lot of times they're just automatically included in um, once you filled out the FAFSA at a lot of schools, um, financial aid packages, obviously not Grinnell, which again, we talked about is why it's so important to kind of know um, where your school is and what you might be um, looking at in terms of aid. So loans are, we'll just kind of, Dip our toe in the water that way and move on to the next slide because it can sometimes be a little overwhelming to talk about loans. Um, but there are other types of loans. So again, if you fill out the FAFSA, you're pretty much going to see those federal direct loans, the subsidized or the unsubsidized on there. But oftentimes families look at loans as options to pay down the remaining balance. And so we'll, we're not going to talk too much about this today, but you'll eventually get a financial aid award letter from each of your schools that says, here's our tuition cost. And then we're subtracting out your scholarship and we're subtracting out all this federal aid you got. And here's your balance due. And sometimes families look at that and say, oh my gosh, well, how will we pay for this? Um, and so there are lots of ways to tackle your balance, payment plans, outside scholarships, which we'll talk about. But the other are something called the parent plus loan or the private loan. Um, big difference here is who the borrower is going to be, the parent plus loan, the parent's the borrower little bit of a higher interest rate and the loan repayment starts earlier. So sometimes this is just a nice way for families to say, we got to pay this balance, but we don't have, you know, $10,000 to pay to write a check right now. We're going to look at a more frequent, smaller loan amount. Whereas if the student is the borrower, we're looking at private or alternative loans. Their interest rate can vary a little bit, as can the fees. Um, this like, follows that traditional, you wouldn't need to pay these backs until six months after graduation, provided you're not in full-time graduate school. You can see it helps bridge the gap. You can borrow up to the cost of attendance, those types of things. Um, so I just wanted to kind of explain the differences of loans because loans, you know, definitely are a big talking point about the cost of higher education. And there are two different types. One is the federal backed ones, which have some solid interest rates. Um, and you know rules around them, and then these are more to it kind of help pay down the balance or uh, help manage the balance of how you're going to pay it. So we can go on to the next slide, Grace. Awesome. Yes. Yeah, so, so we uh, talked a little bit about scholarships earlier, but now we can go a little bit more in depth when it comes to the scholarships. There are different types of scholarships. Um, of course, there are the merit-based awards that institutions may or may not offer. Remember that not every institution does offer their own merit-based awards. Um, so again, important to check out the websites, contact the different aid offices. Um, and it is important to know that at some schools also, uh, a merit award might come from admission, not from aid. So uh, they're usually pretty clear on websites who is uh, deciding those awards and whether a scholarship is part of financial aid stacked on top of need-based aid is a way of meeting need-based aid. Um, but it's important to, again, do that research uh, if you are especially interested in a merit-based award. When it comes to outside scholarships, uh, the big thing is that there are other uh, opportunities for getting uh, scholarships and ways to help support your education that you do not need to pay back. Um, it's important to make sure that those are coming from reputable sources. Uh, there are sources other than the colleges uh, that you can use. Uh, there are websites that we will uh, feature on the next slide that you can also use. But the important thing is that you, if, if you are receiving a outside scholarship, please be sure to send notification of that award immediately, like ASAP to the schools that you are applying to upon receipt of that award, uh, as that is something that the institution will then be taking into account when they're uh, crafting your financial aid or merit scholarship package. And Ran, you know more about these. So yeah. yeah, yeah, perfect. So this is just some great tools for you. If you're like, how do I find those outside scholarships? Where do I start my research? 
Um, you know, then these are some websites that our financial aid offices love that like um, college counselors have told us about. So if you're like, I don't know, will I qualify for any outside scholarships? It asks you um, about things that you're involved in, interests that you have, you know, family, you know, you might be a daughter of, you know, some sort of like, you know, different generational, you know, those types of things. So these are great places to start. You can enter in some specific information um, and then kind of go from there. So the next couple of slides we have are just about our individual um, schools. And I, we want to make sure that we leave some time to see if we have, you know, questions and things like that. So as I run through really quickly, just what merit looks like at SLU, because I think the way SLU does merit scholarships and the way Grinnell does it will give you a little taste. Um, definitely be thinking about what questions you have so we can get those in in our last um, few minutes together. But um, as Grace mentioned in the beginning, um, SLU is one of those schools that for the most part will automatically consider you for merit scholarships when you apply. So just by applying, we're going to look at your GPA, um, test scores if you send them, but we are test optional, so they're not required. Um, and, and automatically award you a scholarship anywhere from $10,000 to $25,000 um, right off the bat for doing nothing other. We're one of those schools that, that takes our aid and wants to use it to reward the student for doing well in high school. We have a couple scholarships um, based on GPA and one based on involvements that um, you can apply for separately because one is full tuition and one is part of um, being a big leadership program on our campus. So those have different deadlines and you have to write separate essays for them, but just know that in general, we are an example of one of those schools that's automatically gonna consider you for merit scholarships. Grace, back to you. Yeah, and uh, quickly for Grinnell. Um, so for Grinnell, we have merit scholarships that are based on holistic review. There's no separate application for applying for those. The one thing that we ask is that your main application, so Grinnell accepts Common App or QuestBridge, uh, we ask that that be submitted by December 1st if you want to be the first considered for a merit-based award. Uh, it does not mean that if you uh, submit your Common App or QuestBridge app after December 1st that you are not eligible. You still are but you won't be first considered for these merit-based scholarships. Our scholarships range from $10,000 to $28,000 a year, renewable every year, no, no uh, you know, need to apply every year for those. That is automatic so long as you maintain that certain GPA. We do give scholarship and financial aid notifications at the same time as your admission notification. So if you are admitted, you'll also have all of your financial information so long as that we received your FAFSA and CSS profile and those required documents on time. And the last big thing is that we do have early decision. We do not have early action at Grinnell. We have an early decision one and two deadline. And with those specific scholarships um, or with those specific deadlines, if admitted to the college through early decision one or early decision two, domestic students are eligible to get a $10,000 Grinnell Choice Scholarship. So a merit-based award that is automatically applied to their application. So that is um, how we do merit-based awards. I think those are great examples of just how different it can be. Uh, and we wanna make sure that we have time for any questions that you have. So please feel free to put those in the chat. I will stop sharing so that we can see everybody's faces. Thank you so much to our wonderful presenters. And as Grace said, we do have some time for questions, about five minutes. If you'd like to put your questions into the chat for our presenters, be happy to answer them for you. And it can be about, like, it, obviously about financial aid, it can be about merit scholarships. Um, if you have well, general questions also, that's fine. Why don't I start off with a question? Um, this is to either Grace or Ann. Um, how would you, and, and I know you did a great job of you know, giving some advice for this process, but how would you advise students to compare costs? Um, would you, you know, rather have them look at you know, the, the cost in the brochure or go through the net price calculator? How is the best way to compare costs between universities? Yeah, I can, uh, okay, so Grace, you wanna take it first or, yeah. Why don't you start and then I'll chime oh, in after. Sure, yeah, I was just going to say, I really do think that um, it one, one thing that is really challenging about navigating financial aid processes is that there are some schools that might give out not much aid, but cost much less. And there are some schools that cost a lot, but they give out an insane amount of financial aid. Um, so, for example, Grinnell has a very expensive sticker price, but 
we give out to our 1,700 students, we are a very small school, we give out more than $65 million in financial aid a year, right? So we give out a lot of aid to support students. There are a lot of schools that, again, you know, have very different ways of showing how they give out aid. And I think the net price calculator is really the best way to actually get a sense of how much you might actually pay. So don't look at the sticker prices, please use those net price calculators. That's why they exist because that is the most uh, effective and efficient way to see what you might actually pay. Looking at the sticker price does not actually give you that uh, accuracy. Yeah, that's totally great. And and I think the net price calculator is so huge if it's if it's, you know, you need it to narrow down your list or to know if a school is realistically going to be in your ballpark. Um, but what will happen is eventually, like I said, you'll get those um, financial aid packages from all your school. And that this is a great question, because that's when you really got to start to compare. Make sure you're comparing apples to apples and not apples to oranges. Some schools, as we mentioned, you know, we all try to spell it out very clearly, but some schools um, might automatically say, oh, you know what, we're going to throw a $10,000 parent plus loan into this financial aid app application because we know they'll qualify and it will help bring down the balance, but you're, you as a family could have no intention of filling out the, the loan or taking a loan. Grace mentioned that they don't offer loans. And so you might compare a financial aid package from Grinnell um, to another school, but maybe the other school's financial aid package includes loans. And that's something that's huge for your family not to involve. So you can definitely do the, the, the price calculator, net price calculator and all that is so great to help get to where you need to be. Um, and then when, it, when you actually get all those letters, really make sure you sit down and compare them all um, to see what the true cost of each school is. Because it can get hard to even be like, wow, this school is only, you know, $10,000, but it might have been, it might include some loans, whereas, you know, other school might not. So keep that in mind too. Perfect. Well, thanks for that. We have a couple more questions that came in. Um, this is a great one. What kind of documentation do students need to provide for scholarships that are based on experiences like volunteering or charity work? What kind of information can students provide for that? Do you, you want to do you want to take that one, uh, Rayanne? Just because we don't yeah. we don't have scholarships based on it's just holistic review at Grinnell. So yeah, absolutely, yeah. So I think what a, what a lot of times too, when a lot of schools use holistic review, when we see those activities and things come in, if they're able to, the counselor might reach out to you and say, "Wow, we see you've been really involved in this, and we see and we've got a scholarship for that, or have you considered this, or or that." Um, in general, some of those scholarship searches and things will help kind of narrow that down and help you figure out what outside scholarships. Um, um, that you might be eligible for. But I think this is where too, we always recommend using your admissions counselor at your each of your schools um, as your big contact, you know, having that relationship, sending an email and saying, these are all the things I'm involved in. I want to learn more about your school, any types of scholarships and, and things like that available. Um, making those connections can really help um, get that information out there. But making sure that you've listed it clearly in your common application or your resume of activities that you're sending in so we can see those things and help identify it for sure. Great, and uh, a couple time for a couple more questions here. This is a good one because um, this is about gap years, and, and gap years are becoming really popular. We've noticed that students are taking uh, that extra extra year of time. What are some great suggestions for managing financial aid for gap years? Great, I can definitely take this too, Grace. I don't know. We I, at St. Louis University, we're very supportive of gap years. Um, and what we do is, is, and this is going to be different for every school. So again, once you've got your list of schools, you know, check with them. If you're thinking about a gap year, a lot of times we say, talk to your school and say, like at St. Louis University, we would say, go ahead and apply now. We can hold, we can defer your scholarship. We can hold everything for a year while you go abroad. And then you don't have to worry about having reliable internet to reapply for, for scholarships or, or things like that. But not every school is that way. Um, there are some things when it comes to gap year, like that some schools will hold, like your scholarship. But I will point out that oftentimes with the gap year, you have to reapply for the financial aid because so much can change in that tax year information that we're looking at. So, you know, gap years in terms of, uh, of a financial standpoint, um, you know, it doesn't, it won't hurt you in the long run either. Gap years are popular, but checking with the schools that you're looking at to see what their policies are for sure. Yeah, and what I, I'll just add related to um, gap year policies and it, like for a school that does, uh, accept them, of course, um, but we have students actually 
deposit at the institution, then request their gap year, and they need to receive um, basically approval for their gap year from the director of admission. So this is what Grinnell does, for example. Um, but if you're approved for a gap year and you're awarded need-based financial aid, you have to reapply for that financial assistance um, by submitting the same required forms um, by the deadlines. Uh, so that's the FAFSA, the CSS profile. Um, and so students who are on a gap year will receive information about that, usually in the January month of their gap year uh, so that they know how to reapply. And when it comes to merit scholarships, schools do this very differently as well. Um, I know for Grinnell, for instance, you'll receive the same award amount when you re-enroll, so to speak, at the college. So when you start, um, because that is based on holistic review of your application, just because you're on a gap year does not change the fact that you deserve that merit scholarship. Um, but it is, uh, like Rayan said, important to make sure to look at the institutions, look at their websites. A lot of them will have a specific web page just on gap years and requesting a gap year and how that process works, especially as it relates to financial aid and merit scholarships. Thanks so much, Grace. And this is our last question. This is a good one. It's a technical question about the FAFSA. Does it matter which parent fills out the FAFSA or which parent gets the FSA ID? That's the question. Yes, great. Uh, this is, um, and I was gonna say, and I might have you, I know Grace doesn't have too much familiarity with it too, but I was gonna say, I might have you help us with um, this question is too, because I know a lot has changed with the FAFSA this year. Um, my understanding is that it is, um, if it's a, a if it's a situation where um, there is a divorce or a separation, the parent that has primary custody, and even if it's like, well, it's a 50-50 split, it's like you can count the days and figure out who had it one, one day more um, is the one who the, the FAFSA and, and that type of thing should be based on. But I understand that that may have changed. Do you have any additional information on that? You know, I don't, I don't know specifically, but I know that at least one parent needs to sign it with their own pin in order to be official, uh, unless the student is emancipated. So parent involvement in, 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 in the FAFSA process is, is key, absolutely. Perfect. All right, well, thanks everyone for joining us today. Um, there are a couple hours left of the college fair. It's gonna start at the top of the hour. And of course, we're gonna be doing a second round of sessions afterwards. If you wanna know more about financial aid, we're gonna be doing this again in just a couple hours. So feel free to come back. But um, thank you to our presenters uh, for a wonderful presentation. And just a reminder that this has been recorded. So if you wanna go back and listen again, you'll have access to it later. Have a wonderful day, everyone. And thanks again for joining us.